Well, folks, good morning. You're all quieting down at just the right moment. So good morning. Welcome. It's great to have you with us. And uh, especially if you're here uh, for the first time uh, or the first time in a while, maybe you've come with a friend and uh, maybe you're passing through on holiday, however you came to be here, and we're glad that you did. Uh, my name's uh, Peter. I'm the minister here. Um, and uh, I hope you've got a service sheet on the way in uh, that'll guide you through our time together. Uh, you'll see all that we're going to do as we uh, sing and pray and praise God and hear his words, uh, the Bible read and explained. And if you're new to church, uh, we try to explain everything we do as we go along. So hopefully uh, you'll know where we are. Um, a little while later, I'll give some more announcements. Um, but uh, for now, let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you that you are here with us, present by your Spirit. We pray that as we come to you today, you would help us to praise you as you, as you deserve, to listen intently to your word, to know the fellowship and encouragement of your people. We pray that it might be for our good and for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Here are some words from Psalm 63 that call our hearts to worship. The psalmist says, you God are my God. Earnestly I seek you, I thirst for you, my whole being longs for you. I have seen you in the sanctuary and beheld your power and your glory. Because your love is better than life, my lips will glorify you. I will praise you as long as I live, and in your name I will lift up my hands. Because you are my help, I sing in the shadow of your wings. And we're going to sing together as we begin, a hymn of praise, praise to the Lord, the Almighty, the King of creation. If you're able, let's stand as we sing together. And in just a moment, the boys and girls are going to head out to their Sunday school groups. But before they do, we always have a brief thought for them. And um, I'm going to tell you, boys and girls, that last week, I was accused of something. I was told that all of my children's talks are always just about football. Now, this is a scandalous accusation, and uh, not at all true. 
And uh, the person who can remain nameless who said this to me said, will you not one day do a talk about, um, I don't know, wedding dresses? And I've thought about it, and the answer is no. So we are back on sport, but I thought I'd give you a rest from football. Now, I know we're not, we're not really on the right side of the border for this one, so apologies, but I thought we'd talk a little bit about cricket today. Now, saying that, Jamie does play in a cricket team in, in Elgin, so there is, there is a bit of Scottish cricket going on. I want you to tell me, have a think, who is the most, not yet, Abby, do not give the answer away. Who is, you'll never guess it now, who is the most important person on a cricket pitch? Is it the batsman? No. Is it the bowler? No. Have you seen the answer? Yes. What is the answer? It's not Jesus. Not. Wait, we're getting there, but not yet. It is the, it's the umpire. Yes, it's the umpire. Now, there's the umpire. He tells people when they're out, and he, he makes sure that everyone keeps the rules. Okay. Now, here's another question, though. What is the most important job that the umpire does? Tricky question. Lots of things you could choose. Any budding cricketers in the room? What's the most important job the umpire does? Jamie? No idea. Hold the jumpers. What? Do you know, I thought you might say give people out or keep the rules. I reckon that you're right. The most important job the umpire does is hold the jumpers, which looks a bit like this. If you don't know, when uh, the bowlers are bowling, sometimes the fielders as well, uh, they, they've come out in the, in, the, in the morning and they think, well, it looks a bit chilly. They think it's a good idea to put a jumper on. But of course, once they start running and playing and bowling, they get hot. And so they can't just leave their jumper on the floor because it might interfere with the game. So what they do is they put their jumpers onto the umpire. Now, I've got a couple of helpers here who are going to come and bring me their jumpers so we can demonstrate this in real life. Fantastic. That's it. Come on. Very good. Do you want to give me a jumper? Okay. There we go. I've promised them that they'll get them back. Fifi, you've got a jumper as well. So I'm a bit warm already, to be honest. But uh, the umpire puts all the jumpers on, not usually like this. Uh, he gets them. Here we go. That's it. Quick, quick. This is more difficult than it looks, isn't it? Here we go. Well done. Keep going. Fantastic. Well done. Okay, so the, the umpire has them like this. And he keeps them all. And uh, I've got to say, it's a, if I've got a few more, it's a pretty unpleasant job, especially on a summer's day, being an umpire and carrying all these jumpers. But that's what he does, so that the players can be free from the burden of their jumpers and so that they can play. Now, friends, that is a little bit like who, Fifi? Jesus, that's right. Now, you're all thinking, how on earth is an umpire with his jumpers like Jesus? Well, just like the players, when they came out that morning, they thought it was a good idea to put a jumper on. They thought that that would be the right thing to do. But in the end, it turned out to be the wrong thing to do. It was too hot. And we're a bit like that, aren't we? We go about our day, and we think it might be the right thing to break God's law. We know that sin is breaking God's law. We think it might be a good idea to do the wrong thing, to do the naughty thing, to disobey our parents or hurt other people. We think it's a good idea. We think it will be fun. But in the end, we just end up with the burden of all the wrong things we've done. And they weigh us down and they make us, well, not hot, but they make us uncomfortable. It's not good, is it, when we know we've done something wrong? But Jesus is like the umpire. Why? Because when he dies on the cross, he takes on himself, not our jumpers, but all the things that we have done that we know are wrong, all the ways that we've broken God's law, and it's not very comfortable for Jesus doing that. Why? Because he has to go to the cross to die, to pay for our sin. But he does it anyway. He takes our sin on himself so that we can be saved. Isn't that good? And here's a verse from the Bible. And I wonder, boys and girls, if you could learn this verse off by heart. Some might know it already. It says, he himself, that's Jesus, he himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. 
Should we say that together so we can remember it? Here we go. Are you ready? He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so we might die to sins and live for righteousness. One more time. You ready? He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so we might die to sins and live for righteousness. Fantastic. And maybe later on when we're at our picnic lunch all together, the, uh, the grown-ups can test the children or the children can test the grown-ups to see if we've learned that verse. Fantastic. Well, boys and girls, in just a moment, we are going to send you off with our great Sunday school leaders uh, to our Sunday school groups. And you will get your jumpers back, I promise. You can come and get them on the way. Shall I just pray, though, before you go? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for Jesus who took our sins. Please help us to listen to him today, to learn from him, to know what it means to live for him and to follow him as his forgiven children. In Jesus' name, amen. Fantastic. So kids, as you head to Sunday school, if you want to collect your jumpers on the way past, you can do. Undamaged. Some of them are inside out. Fantastic. Wonderful. Well... I, uh, I sat down with my father-in-law and I said, what's the best children's talk you've ever heard? And he said it was that, so I don't know what you make of it, but uh, he thought it was good. So he didn't have anything about a wedding dress, so uh, we'll see. Well, we're going to pray again. Shall we continue in prayer? Let's bow our heads as we join together. Our Heavenly Father, we do worship and praise you. At the beginning of a new week, we acknowledge that you Our God, you are the maker of all, the giver of everything that is good. Father, we thank you and praise you that you have sustained your world for another day, for another week. And that you, by your grace, have sustained us. Father, we do confess as we learned with the children, that we are prone to wander from you. We thank you that Christ, your own son, has gone to the cross for our sin. We come to you, Father, confessing our sin, and yet full of confidence that Christ has died, that Christ has paid, that he has risen from death and conquered the sting of sin and death. And we thank you, Father, that we sit here today, not as your enemies, but if we trust you as your children. And we pray again that as you're present with us today, as your word is read and preached, that you would be pleased to speak to us, to instruct us, to teach us, to help us, that we might be more like your son, our saviour, the Lord Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, let me just uh, again say welcome, and um, we we often take a moment to give some announcements uh, about church life. A few things to say today. Uh, Perhaps the most pressing is that uh, straight after this service, we are having a, a joint church family picnic Uh, with our friends from uh, the Elgin Free Church congregation. Um, You'll know, I'm sure, that we're in the process of of those two churches being linked together, so it's an important part of that process, uh, that we get to know each other and spend time together. So uh, straight after the service today, we'll be heading uh, through to Rosile and to the Rosile Village Hall. Uh, If you don't know where that is, head out of Burkhead, get to the Rosile Crossroads, turn right, and then immediately left, you'll see the hall there. I'm sure you can follow, follow someone. Uh, if you need a lift and you're here today, uh, speak to someone around you, speak to me. I'm sure we can organize that as well. And uh, if you haven't brought a picnic, I'm sure we can share around as well. We'd love to have you come and join us for that. 
Uh, the blue sheet, which you have inside there, uh, your white sheet, uh, guides you through the week. There's a diary there. There's things to pray for every day. Come back and join us tonight. I'm continuing our series on doctrine. Monday morning, we meet to pray. Uh, to pray. Wednesday evening, we've got our church family prayer cafe. That's in here. We meet in here around tables with uh, tea and coffee, refreshments, uh, snacks, and we have a Bible talk, and we share some fellowship, and we pray. And uh, if you've not come before, it would be a great time uh, to come along and join us for that. Thursday night, our Pathfinders youth group continues, and uh, that takes us through to next Sunday. Uh, I'll be away next Sunday. I'm preaching through uh, in Kiltality uh, in the Highlands, uh, but Paul, one of our elders, and Davy, our minister in training, will be preaching. Uh, Davy's not here today because he's preaching down in Livingston, so uh, we're getting around, both of us. Uh, the last thing to mention is uh, our Jubilee Community Celebration Invitation Service. Uh, this is uh, Sunday the 5th of June. Uh, there are some community activities happening on the Salmon Green in the afternoon, and there are some flyers available at the back for that. Uh, but as a church, we're, we're hosting what we hope will be a service for our whole community. And uh, I reckon it's a time when some people might come along to a service like that who wouldn't normally be in church. So you can take and use these flyers. They have gone through every door in the village already, uh, but there's nothing like personal invitation. So please take them, please use them. We've got a whole stack of them. If you want to take them, and if you don't live in Burkhead, deliver them to your street or whatever, please feel free uh, to do that. Take and use them um, as you can. Well, enough from me. Uh, you, you might know that our small groups, which aren't meeting this week, but our small groups uh, are linked up with our mission partners. And uh, from time to time, we hear reports and updates uh, from those uh, mission partners. And uh, I'm going to introduce Richard, I think, who's going to introduce our, our mission partner, who is here real life in the flesh. So Richard, over to you first. Morning, everyone. So, um we're part of the Forest Small Group, and the, the Forest Small Group was linked up with SASRA, and in particular with Roddy McLeod, who works at uh, Kinloss in Fort George. And uh, thankfully, this week, you don't have to listen to me because Roddy is here in person, and uh, he'll be up here in a, a couple of minutes to give an update in person. Um, as usual, we've updated the mission board at the back uh, with uh, prayer notes and information, and there is loads and loads of SASRA information as well. So uh, please, uh, after the service, Help yourself to as much as you can, and uh, we'll go from there. So, Roddy, thanks for coming. And, uh, Thank you. I love doing that. Listen, morning all, it's a great privilege for us to be here in church today. Uh, if you think of what we own in the sense of Christ in our hearts, if we're believers here today, and the world around us is largely ignorant to that. Uh, I work among soldiers. You might have guessed that by this <laughs> pajamas that I've got on today. Uh, it's a huge privilege we have as, so, as ex-soldiers to go in amongst soldiers and to bring the gospel to them. Prayer is crucial to that. Your prayers are crucial to that. I've often, uh, when, when things are happening, in fact, there was a, a, a bit of administration we had to do for my family and it was over a period of months and as things were going wrong and we were praying about it and I was praying about it looking back with hindsight it was amazing how God answered every single prayer and everything worked out in the end and that's often the way it is in life we're praying about things things go wrong things sometimes are great and joyous and we pray about it and answers come because God is real that's the amazing thing that's what I used to think when I was a young person, a non-believer, uh, that God is just follow the rules and hope for the best. But it's nothing like that. It's a relationship with a God that is real. Uh, just to talk a little bit about our, our organization, Sastra, uh, we hope to grow. We want to grow to 30 scripture readers, 10 with the RAF, 20 with the army. We have about 15 at the moment in work. So pray for that uh, opportunity. We have many opportunities. Camps and chaplains are asking us for scripture readers and we haven't got them to give at the moment. So pray for ex-servicemen to come into the work, particularly ex-REF people. Uh, pray for those that have, we, we have a couple who's now, they're just 
entering the work and one called Jacinta has just finished training and uh, pray for her as she, I think as far as I know she's going to go to one of the RAF bases uh, to, to fill a slot there pray for her it, it can be very daunting putting on this uniform and going out amongst service personnel to share the gospel it can be very daunting to do it anywhere but it's particularly daunting in the military pray for readers scripture readers with health issues Many of our readers are a bit older like myself, although I'm not that old, but not as old as Peter, <laughs> but uh, a bit older. One of our scripture readers, Jim, Hender uh, Jim Henderson, may need a heart transplant, and that's very, very serious, you know. So pray for, pray for those of us that are struggling with health issues. The soldiers themselves... At the moment, I can't say too much about what they're doing because of the, the whole situation we find in the world at the moment. So I can't really say much about what they're up to. Uh, but there's a lot of uncertainty. There's an awful lot of uncertainty. It's uncertainty for all of us. Uh, an example of that would be, uh, in the past, would be, well, fairly recently, was all pitting, where the three Scots, the, the Blackboard soldiers from Fort George, were going to Kabul airport to secure the airport and help with that evacuation. And they, I went into the camp at about eight in the morning, one Monday morning, and they'd been up since four. And they were running around, rushing around, trying to get ready to go to the south of England, first of all, and then on to Cyprus, and then on to Kabul airport. And in the, the way things worked out, and this happens a lot, they got as far as the south of England and didn't go any further. So you can imagine their disappointment, and it might sound silly to say they were disappointed not to have gone, but that's what they train for, that's what they do, that's what they're here for, and they love to do their job. Uh, so, you know, for all the preparation and all the rush and all the hassle, and then to go nowhere is a bit of an anticlimax. But that's typical of army life. Uh, soldiers' families pay a high price, you know. Uh, at the moment, there's a lot of soldiers away, and they don't know when they're coming back. And that uncertainty is very difficult, particularly for young children. And, and dad or mum may come back for a, a week's R&R &R and then go away again. And that's possibly more difficult than if they hadn't come home at all. So pray for our families, our, our soldiers' families. Uh, our aim as an organization is that every soldier or airman hears the gospel at least once in their lifetime. And I spent a lot of time just doing that, sharing the absolute basics of the gospel, that we're sinners, that there's a savior, and so on. Uh, the people I speak to have no concept whatsoever of what the Bible talks about. They have no idea about the Bible. They know nothing about the Bible. When I was in Purbright a number of years ago, it was a recruits depot, and we'd have as many as 400 in church on a Sunday. And I would ask them, who knows nothing at all about the Bible? And nearly all of them would put their hands up every single time. So we're in a pretty poor state in that sense. Pray for Christian soldiers. We have a number of Christian soldiers. I have a fellowship that we meet here, or near now. We're kind of juggling around between the two now. Pray for these guys. Life is tough as a Christian in the military. It's really tough uh, in many ways. Uh, so I won't take up any more time uh, with that, but just pray for my family as well, Esther, myself, and the boys. Like everyone else, we have ups and downs, we have problems in life, and the amazing thing is God is with us. But I'm really chuffed that Timmy went to Sunday school, because uh, I would have embarrassed him if he was here. And he said a couple of weeks, about a week ago, or two weeks ago, he said, when I'm an I've been chasing him off screens, you see. And he said, when I'm an adult, I'm going to watch the Care Bears for as long as I like. <laughs> so he, he, he gets a bit annoyed with me because I'm telling people that. And he goes, all right, Daddy. So anyway, pray for us. Keep praying for us. It's, it's essential. Prayer is the one thing that everybody can do. And it's probably the hardest thing we can do. And yet, it's so effective. I, I could just finish off. I've had so many answers to prayer. Miracles. Changes in providence, comfort, blessing, souls saved, and yet I'm so slow to pray. Keep that thought. Thank you. Thank you very much. <coughs> Hi, Roddy.
thank you so much. It's great to have you here. Uh, it's great to hear from you. And I know you're sticking around for the picnic as well. Um, no Care Bears there, so um, that'll be great. Uh, I think Gavin will lead us later on in prayer, and I'm sure he'll pray for Sazra as well uh, in his prayers. But for now, we're going to sing again. We love to sing from the Psalms, and uh, sometimes we sing unaccompanied without instruments because the instruments are great, but really it's our voices that matter. And uh, here's a great psalm of praise to God, words from Psalm 96. Shall we stand? Let's sing together. All nations to the Lord ascribe the glory. Let's come to God in prayer. Loving Heavenly Father, we praise you that you are an almighty God who formed the universe by your spoken word, the author and creator of life who gives us our very breath and sustains us daily. You give us clothes to wear and food to eat. Amazingly, you care for us and love us even though so often we turn away from you and sin against you. Lord, we deserve to be punished for rejecting our Creator, yet you show us great mercy and love us so much that you sent your one and only Son, Jesus, to die for our sins, that we're afforded the immense privilege of being able to draw near to you as we are presented faultless before you, clothed with the righteousness of Christ. Yet we still sin, Lord, and now we confess those sins, both known and unknown, that cause us to take our eyes off you and distance ourselves from your holy presence. Forgive us, we pray, and restore our hearts and renew our spirits that we may once again be able to come into a closer relationship with you. Show us your ways, Lord. Teach us your paths. Guide us in your truth and teach us, for you are God, our Saviour, and our hope is in you. Help us to do what is right, not what is easy, and give us the courage and conviction to go boldly and tell others about your amazing love and sacrifice and what you have done in our lives. Lord, we thank you that you're a loving and just God who longs to accept our praise and listen to all our prayers, whether they be of thanksgiving and worship, confession or intercession. We humbly come before you with the thoughts and concerns of our hearts, with the confidence that you will not only hear, but answer them according to your holy will. Heavenly Father, we bring before you this morning all our prayer partners, and in particular the work of Roddy and Sandra. Lord, in a time of increased global conflict, 
and our armed forces being called to readiness, there is a real need for your words of life and hope to reach all our serving personnel. We pray for Roddy and all scripture readers that the opportunities are presented for them to have meaningful conversations and that many will be convicted of their sin and turn to you, Lord. We pray for all our armed forces at this time, wherever they are serving in the world. Protect them, we pray, and give them a real sense of your presence. Father, we particularly ask that you raise up more scripture readers that your word may go out. Lord, we ask you for your blessing on the proposed linkage between Burkhead and Elgin Free Churches, and that this vision would see many in those two communities coming to know you as their Lord and Saviour. We pray for Peter, Colin, and the elders of both congregations. Give them wisdom and discernment as they work out the practicalities of a linked church. We pray that this coming together would act as a catalyst for your word spreading out all along the Murray Coast and a drawing of people to you. Lord, bless this afternoon's picnic at Rose Isle. Let us have good conversations and give us a sense of unity as we join together as diverse people but with a common love for you. Father, we remember those who cannot be with us today for whatever reasons and pray your blessing on all who are suffering in body, mind or spirit. Strengthen and comfort them that they may experience your healing and peace. Draw close to them that they may be reassured by your presence and feel the protection and security of being upheld in your everlasting arms. Lord, we thank you that you are the everlasting God who doesn't grow faint or grow weary but lifts us up on wings like eagles. And now, Lord, we pray for your continued blessing on us as we continue with our praises to you and hear your words of truth. Bless Peter as he opens the scripture to us and clear our minds of any distractions that we may hear what you have, will have us know and our hearts may be challenged. All these things we pray to the power of your Holy Spirit and in the precious name of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you, Gavin. Here are some words from another psalm. Words from Psalm 65. In Zion, praise awaits you, Lord. Let's stand, shall we? Let's sing. do sit and Emma's going to come and read for us from Isaiah. Uh, you might not know if you knew but we're in a, a little series in the book of Isaiah. We're coming to chapter 5 which is the end of the introduction to Isaiah really and God is summing up all the things he said to his people in the form of a song. You don't have to sing it Emma though you can just read it so thank you. Isaiah chapter 5 um, you can find it if you're using the church bibles on page 690. I will sing for the one I love, a song about his vineyard. My loved one had a vineyard on a fertile hillside. He dug it up and cleared it of stones and planted it with the choicest vines. He built a watchtower in it and cut out a wine press as well. Then he looked for a crop of good grapes, but it yielded only bad fruit. 
Now, you dwellers in Jerusalem and people of Judah, judge between me and my vineyard. What more could have been done for my vineyard than I had done for it? When I looked for good grapes, why did it yield only bad? Now I will tell you what I'm going to do to my vineyard. I will take away its hedge and it will be destroyed. I will break down its wall and it will be trampled. I will make it a wasteland, neither pruned nor cultivated, and briars and thorns will grow there. I will command the clouds not to rain on it. The vineyard of the Lord Almighty is the nation of Israel and the people of Judah are the vines he delighted in. And he looked for justice, but saw bloodshed, for righteousness, but heard cries of distress. Woe to you who add house to house and join field to field till no space is left and you live alone in the land. The Lord Almighty has declared in my hearing, surely the great houses will become desolate, the fine mansions left without occupants. A 10 acre vineyard will produce only a bath of wine, a homer of seed will yield only an ephah of grain. Woe to those who rise early in the morning to run after their drinks, who stay up late at night till they are inflamed with wine. They have harps and lyres at their banquets, pipes and tambourines and wine, but they have no regard for the deeds of the Lord, no respect for the work of his hands. Therefore, my people will go into exile for lack of understanding. Those of high rank will die of hunger and the common people will be parched with thirst. Therefore, death expands its jaws, opening wide its mouth. Into it will descend their nobles and masses with their brawlers and revelers. So people will be brought low and everyone humbled, the eyes of the arrogant humbled. But the Lord Almighty will be exalted by his justice and the holy God will be proved holy by his righteous acts. Then sheep will graze as in their own pastures. Lambs will feed among the ruins of the rich. Woe to those who draw sin along with cords of deceit and wickedness as with cart ropes. To those who say, let God hurry, let him hasten his work so that we may see it. The plan of the Holy One of Israel, let it approach, let it come into view so that we may know it. Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Woe to those who are wise in their own eyes and clever in their own sight. Woe to those who are heroes at drinking wine and champions at mixing drinks who acquit the guilty for a bribe, but deny justice to the innocent. Therefore, as tongues of fire lick up straw and as dry grass sinks down in the flames, so their roots will decay and their flowers blow away like dust. For they have rejected the law of the Lord Almighty and spurned the word of the Holy One of Israel. Therefore, the Lord's anger burns against his people. His hand is raised and he strikes them down. The mountains shake and the dead bodies are like refuse in the streets. Yet for all this, his anger is not turned away. His hand is still upraised. He lifts up a banner for the distant nations. He whistles for those at the ends of the earth. Here they come swiftly and speedily. Not one of them grows tired or stumbles. Not one slumbers or sleeps. Not a belt is loosened at the waist. Not a sandal strap is broken. Their arrows are sharp. All their bows are strung. Their horses' hooves seem like flint. Their chariot wheels like a whirlwind. Their roar is like that of the lion. They roar like young lions. They growl as they seize their prey and carry it off with no one to rescue. In that day, they will roar over it like the roaring of the sea. And if one looks at the land, there is only darkness and distress. Even the sun will be darkened by clouds. Emma, thank you. Uh, We want to pray for God's help. These words uh, may be familiar. Perhaps they'll seem quite foreign to us, written uh, many uh, years ago. So let's pray for the Lord's help. Father, we thank you that you tell us that all Scripture is breathed out by you and is useful for us. And so, Lord, we pray that you'd help us to understand your word, what it says, what it means. And perhaps most of all, what it means to us today. In Jesus' name, amen. Southern trees bear a strange fruit. 
blood on the leaves and blood at the root. Black bodies swinging in the southern breeze, strange fruit hanging from the poplar trees. Those are some of the disturbing words of Billy Holiday's song, Strange Fruit. It's a graphic protest song about the evil racist lynchings in the American South under Jim Crow laws. Billy Holiday and, and other artists as well who wrote protest songs understood something key. If you're going to make a case, if you're going to fuel a, mu- a movement, if you want to change someone's mind and change their behavior, sometimes what you need is not argument, but art. Sometimes a logical case presented as a letter or a book or a speech or a sermon, dare I say, isn't enough. Sometimes you don't need a sermon. Sometimes you need a song to capture people's hearts and minds. And so we get protest songs. And I say that because this chapter 5 in the book of Isaiah, which rounds off the introduction to the whole thing, is in effect God's protest song. It sums up God's strong word of warning against his people. Here in the book of Isaiah, so far God's people, that is the kingdom of Judah, have ignored the warnings and ignored the sermons. And so maybe, maybe a song will do it. Maybe a song will tug at their hardened hearts and make them wake up and listen. Well, three headings as we navigate this chapter today. Why God's heart is breaking, why Judah's judgment is coming, and what we must do now. And there's headings and space to take notes on your white sheet. Let's get going. Number one, why God's heart is breaking. Listen again to verse one. I will sing for the one I love a song about his vineyard on a fertile hillside. He dug it up. And cleared it of stones and planted it with the choicest vines. He built a watchtower in it and cut a wine press out as well. You might think, what on earth is all that about? Well, you need to know that in the Bible, a vineyard is often used as a metaphor. I suppose because vineyards were a common thing in that part of the world. Now, in the Bible, the vineyard is sometimes used to represent different things, but here as in many other places, it obviously represents God's people, the nation of Israel, or specifically the southern part of that, the kingdom of Judah. Now, if this is a protest song, in a way, it's also an unrequited love song, because the song begins by painting a picture of the love and kindness and generosity that God has shown to his people. The message is this. God has shown love expressed in plenty and protection and provision. First, plenty. The picture is is of a vineyard on a fertile hillside. God has planted this vineyard. He didn't have to, but he has. And he's planted it in a fertile place. And in the same way that the real point is that God has chosen his people. He didn't have to, but he has. And he's planted them, as it were. He's given them the promised land to live in, a fertile, beautiful place. He's even cleared the stones out of the vineyard, which is maybe a reference to the the conquest of the land when God drove out other nations to give it to his own people. God in his love has given them plenty. But he's also offered them protection. The owner of the vineyard, look at verse 2 again, built a watchtower in it. Which means God has given his people peace and security. God himself watches over them and keeps them from harm. Reminds me of these verses in Psalm 121. The Lord watches over you. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun will not harm you by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all harm. He will watch over your life. God has said that. God has done that for his people. 
Despite their continued rebellion against him, he gave them plenty, he gave them protection, and he made great provision. Again, just picture the metaphor. For this vineyard, the owner has done everything necessary. He's provided everything for it to be a good and fertile vineyard. There's nothing he's he's held back. He's planted it with the choicest vines, verse 2. He's put it on a fertile hillside, verse 1. The soil has been cleared and cultivated, verse 2. There was even a watchtower, as we've seen, to ward off enemies. And there was even a wine press already there to receive the good fruit. God did everything. He provided everything for his people. And so the appeal goes out, verse 3. Now you dwellers in Jerusalem, people of Judah, judge between me and my vineyard. What more could I have done for my vineyard than I have done for it? But when I looked for good grapes, why did it yield only bad? You see, just as the owner of the vineyard, having done everything for it, it, had every right to expect there would be good fruit, so the Lord had every right to expect fruitful living, by which he means godliness, from his people that he had provided for and cared for and loved. And yet, as we've seen Week after week in this series, already in Isaiah, Judah is not like that at all. It's, it's wayward. They've turned from God to worship human might and pride and power instead. They've ignored God's word. And as a result, the nation is full of injustice and poverty and strife and trouble. And now God says there's going to be judgment. Verse 5. Now I will tell you what I'm going to do to my vineyard. I will take away its hedge and it will be destroyed. I will break down its wall and it will be trampled. I will make it a wasteland, neither pruned nor cultivated. And briars and thorns will grow there. I will command the clouds not to rain on it. God says he will remove its protection and its blessing. And just in case any of the lyrics of this song about the vineyard and the whole metaphor have left you in any doubt about the song's real meaning, it gets summed up there in chapter 5, verse 7. The vineyard of the Lord Almighty is the nation of Israel, and the people of Judah are the vines he delighted in. He's saying, do you get it? He looked for justice, but saw bloodshed. For righteousness, but heard cries of distress. Now, you might ask, well, why does God judge? Doesn't this sound a bit harsh? Is it fair? Well, no, we know that God is always just and fair. Actually, we've seen more than that. He's abundantly kind. And yet, because he's good, he must judge evil. He doesn't judge evil in spite of being good. He judges evil because he is good. These people have rejected him and his kindness. But what about us? What about us? Do we stop to consider and to acknowledge God's kindness, his abundant provision, his generosity in our own lives? Or do we take what he has to give and ignore the giver? The book of Romans says that kind of attitude is actually the heart of what sin is. Listen to this, Romans 1.21. For although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him. Instead, their thinking became futile, their foolish hearts were darkened. Couldn't that be a summary of life in the nation of Judah? What about us? See, a failure to acknowledge God as the giver of all things pretty soon becomes a failure to thank God, which is in essence a failure to to exalt God as he alone deserves. And so we bring God down. And what do we do when we bring God down? We raise ourselves up instead. Why does God judge? Is this harsh? No, not at all. God is just and fair and abundantly kind. And all of that leads us to point number two. 
why Judah's judgment is coming. The song now unfolds into, into a series of woes. God gives a whole list of, a list of reasons for his coming judgment and a whole range of descriptions of what that judgment will, will be like. We'll take them one at a time. Firstly, I've called this one, <laughs> woe to you grand designers. Look at verse 8. Woe to you who add house to house and join field to field till no space is left and you alone live in the land. Something specific to remember about land in Israel, and it's this. The land was allotted by God. It had been divided up and, and apportioned up to all the tribes so that all the tribes and all the families within all the tribes would have land to live on. Remember, in this society, land is not just a place for a house. It's a place to farm. So land means livelihood. Land means life. And because of that, God had given strict rules about selling land. In most cases, you are not permitted to sell your land. You can read about that in 1 Kings 21 later on if you want to. And again, the reason for this was to ensure justice and prevent poverty. So that some people didn't just do a land grab. Here's what one Bible commentator says to explain. He says, when these rules gave way to the greed of speculators, it created a class of landless, unemployed, without home, livelihood, or civil rights. And so instead of land for all, those who have more, buy more, take more, amass more. And the result is a society where there are these grand designers, as I'm calling them, who have more and more and more land to extend their property and their farming and impoverish others. God says, if you're doing that, woe to you. Judgment is coming to you. You who enrich yourselves at the expense of others. God says, you might think you're, you're doing the right thing here. You might think it's wise. You might think it's a canny business decision. You might think you'll be secure and productive if you do this. You know, if you expand your houses and get bigger fields and maybe that'll make you more efficient, you'll produce more crops and be, uh, be more wealthy and have more money. God says, no, in the end it will come to nothing because, verse 9... The Lord Almighty has declared in my hearing, surely the great houses will become desolate. The fine mansions left without occupants. A 10 acre vineyard will produce only a bath of wine. A homer of seed will yield only an ether of grain. Not very much, in other words. And what about our culture? Can we say we're any different? Can we say our hearts are really any different? Now, look, the, the, the distribution of wealth around our country, never mind around the world, is far from simple. Solutions to poverty that really work are far from simple. There are not simplistic answers here. But we need to remember that Christians have always been concerned with poverty and with inequality. And we should be as well. Being concerned about poverty and inequality is a mark of being a biblical Christian. At very least, we could say that there is a responsibility on the wealthy to be generous to the needs of those who have less. Now, some of that might happen through taxes. Some of it might happen through charitable giving. Some of it might happen in the way we use our time and our gifts and our lives. Of course, another way that people are lifted out of poverty is not just charity, but trade. And so in a kind of globalized economy that we have, some of our concern for the poor might be directed in our decisions about the things we do and don't buy. Some years ago, Tear Fund were involved in a campaign called Lift the Label. It sought to guide Christians on the way that they buy food and clothes because those choices have a huge impact on workers in developing nations. I don't think that particular campaign is running anymore, but 
It makes the point, those sorts of things are things that should be of interest to us because they reflect a concern for justice which was sorely lacking in Judah, where these grand designers wanted more and more land and bigger and bigger houses and greater and greater profits. Woe to you, grand designers. Next, woe to you, daytime drinkers. I'm aware that these headings sound a bit like a Bob Dylan song, but... Here we go. Woe to you, daytime drinkers. Verse 11. Woe to you who rise early in the morning and run after their drinks, who stay up late at night till they're inflamed with wine. They have harps and lyres at their banquets, pipes and timbrels and wine, but they have no regard for the deeds of the Lord, no respect for the work of his hands. Here is the lifestyle that is centered only on the pursuit of pleasure and parties. From early in the morning to late at night, these people are single-minded in their pursuit of a right good time. These are the people who say, oh, you've got to squeeze all the juice out of life. right? Live for the moment. Eat, drink, be merry. Life is short. Seize the day. All these slogans are all around us, actually, aren't they? I reckon these are almost like the religious doctrines of our day. So if you walk down Grand Street later on today and you said to a passerby, maybe in the middle of a conversation, you know, don't just sort of try it off the bat, but if you said, oh, you only live once, life is short, let's squeeze the juice out and have a good time, I reckon virtually everyone would say, they wouldn't say amen, would they? But they would say that, but they'd say yes, they'd agree with you. That is basically the religion of 2022. But God says if you think like that, Woe to you. In other words, judgment to you. And I reckon that should stop us in our tracks because we, I reckon, are likely to get sucked into this way of thinking too because it's all around us. Live for the moment. Have a good time. Prioritize your pleasure. But how many bad decisions are made because they sacrificed long-term good for short-term pleasure? And most especially... God is saying this, this live for the moment attitude makes us ignore God. The focus of our attention is all on our pleasure. And so God is obviously sidelined, especially when God often calls us not to gratify the desires of our sinful nature. When his commands often tell us to put others before ourselves. When God tells us to do what is right before what is easy. Can you see the clash? You see just that in verse 22. Woe to those who are heroes at drinking wine and champions at mixing drinks, who acquit the guilty for a bribe and deny justice for the innocent. Do you see the connection? If you're all about your pleasure, you'll cut whatever corners you need to get there. Now, Some people might say this sounds like a hard message. Now let's be clear, God is not saying we mustn't enjoy his world or his creation or enjoy food or drink or fun or family or friends. These things are good and if we receive them as good gifts from his hand with thanksgiving, that's good. But a life lived just for pleasure that ignores God is not what he commands. In fact, God says to us to forego seeking pleasure instead to serve him. Of course, ironically, those who prioritize their own pleasure often have to search harder and harder to find it. And when they do, they find it less and less satisfying. And true to that form, in Judah, God says that though they have sought to be the heart and soul of the party, though they wanted to be having a good time and at the center of all the action, God is going to send them away from the center of all the action away into exile, away from this place which has become for them a place of pleasure and plenty and parties, into a place of need. That's his judgment. Verse 13, therefore my people will go into exile for lack of understanding. Those of high rank will die of hunger and the common people will be parched with thirst. Therefore death expands its jaws, opening wide its mouth. Into it will descend their nobles, and their masses, with all their brawlers and revelers. Next, woe to you, continual 
liars. Look at verse 18 now. Woe to those who draw, along, uh, who, who, who draw sin along with cords of deceit and wickedness as with cart ropes. What's going on here? Well, these people are telling lies. More specifically than that, when you read on, you see that they are telling lies or sowing doubts about God. Read on verse 19. To those who say, let God hurry, let him hasten his work so we may see it. The plan of the Holy One of Israel, let it approach, let it come into view so that we may know it. They're mocking here. They're sowing doubts about God. They're saying, in effect, he won't ever really show up. He won't ever really keep his promises. He won't ever really fulfill his plans. Probably doesn't have any plans. There's more than a hint here of, of the attitude that we, we found in the early church sometimes. Listen to this from 2 Peter 3. Above all, you must understand that in the last days, scoffers will come, scoffing and following their own evil desires. They will say, where is this coming? He promised. Ever since our ancestors died, everything goes on as it did since the beginning of creation. In other words, Jesus isn't really coming back. God isn't going to show up. You don't need to be bothered with all this religious stuff. It just slows you down and spoils your fun. How wrong you are, says God. How misguided you are. Woe to you if you think like that. And woe to you, especially if you spread doubts and lies about God to other people. There's a hint here of of false teaching, which is often so deadly in the church, including in the church here in Scotland today. All over the country, including here in Murray, there are so-called church ministers telling people that Jesus isn't really the only way to God, that sin's not really a problem. These are people who don't really believe the Bible to be the word of God. They, they, they won't really tell you about the need for repentance and salvation. They speak about glory in heaven, but never about judgment. They may dress in fancy religious gear. But false teachers like that are really not so very different from the people of Judah, who mocked the idea of a God who was coming not just to save, but also to judge. Now, look, the last thing we want to be is uncharitable. We certainly don't want to make out that we are the only true church. That's not true at all. There are many fine Christian people and churches here in Murray. Not enough. We want more, but many. And we do want gospel partnership with other believers. But that's the word you see, gospel partnership can't be in unity and partnership in the gospel with people who simply don't believe and preach the gospel. I spoke to one local minister recently, a, a faithful gospel preaching guy, who told me that he was leaving the local minister's fraternal because one of the leading lights of the group was publicly writing in the, in the local newspaper in support of all kinds of things, including transgender ideology speaking of which letter d woe to you moral confusers verse 20 now woe to those who call evil good and good evil who put darkness for light and light for darkness who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter this kind of captures it all doesn't it those people in judah who called evil things good and made out that good things were really evil. I don't think I even really need to make the connections with our culture today. They speak for themselves, don't they? There's so many things we can mention, but how about this? In the last couple of weeks, there was the leaked judgment from the US Supreme Court suggesting that there may be a vote to overturn the Roe v. Wade decision on abortion. 
Now, look, even if this is true, in reality, I don't think it would make much difference. It would just make abortion a state-by-state -state issue in the states, and it's pretty clear that most states would simply pass their own laws to keep it legal. So it might not even be a particularly significant decision in the grand scheme of things, and yet the rhetoric, the pushback from the pro-choice campaigners, including much of the media, has been massive. Because for them, any attempt to limit abortion is morally wrong. For them, the right to terminate the life of unborn children is a moral good. For them, that's, a, that's something right which must be upheld. Now, this is not the only moral issue, don't get me wrong, but it is a moral issue. Do you see? They call evil good and good evil. And the truth is, our world is a mess of moral confusion. I didn't have to search hard for an example like that. I could give you many more. And God says, woe to us for that kind of pride. And it is pride because it assumes the place of God. Again, that's the heart of sin, isn't it? To take God's place, to remake his law, for us to become the ones who define what is good and evil on our terms, not on his. I'm aware that as I raise an issue like that, it might have all kinds of implications or bring up all kinds of feelings or even memories for people. We mustn't be unaware that these are not just political hot potatoes. They are personal issues, often keenly felt. And yet God's word still is clear. Woe to you, moral confusers. Letter E, woe to you, justice deniers. We're getting there now. Look at verse 22. Woe to, you, to those who are heroes at drinking wine, champions at mixing drinks, but who acquit the guilty for a bribe and deny justice for the innocent. Again, there's this concern for justice to be done. And again, remember, it's not just about justice. It's not just a practical issue. At its heart, it's a spiritual issue. Isaiah is saying, lose your connection with God, who is the just judge, and sooner or later will become a more and more unjust, unjust society. And the consequences of the coming judgment for all these reasons are so serious. Chapter 5, verse 24. Therefore, as tongues of fire lick up straw, and as dry grass sinks down into the flames, so their roots will decay. Their flowers blow away like dust, for they have rejected the law of the Lord Almighty and spurned the word of the Holy One of Israel. We don't have time to do the detail, but in the last five verses, verse 25 to verse 30, we get, we get a, a, a painting, almost a picture almost painted for us of how this judgment will come. It will come in the form of invading armies whom God will allow in to invade, to ransack the nation, and ultimately to carry people off into exile. As an aside... History tells us that God used the nation of Babylon to do that, who were themselves desperately wicked. The Babylonians deserve God's judgment in their own right, and sooner or later it comes to them as well. But just now, God will use them in his plans, which tells you something about the absolute sovereignty of God. He's in charge of all. He rules over all. He can direct all, all events and every and any person to his own cause. That's his power. So we've seen why God's heart is breaking. We've seen why Judah's judgment is coming. But the question I guess you're asking is, well, so what? What's it got to do with me? So number three, what must we do now? Well, firstly, we must get ready to resume. There's a bunch of things here. They all begin with R. 
We've got to get ready to resume the story next week. These first five chapters have just been the introduction to the main themes. From this point onwards, we're going to get into Isaiah's specific call to ministry, and then we'll move from the kind of general picture of what's going on into the specifics, including the specifics of the hope that God offers. So we're going to resume, but next, we've been doing this already, we must recognize these patterns. Sometimes you meet people, or at least I do, I'm sure you're the same. Sometimes you meet people who say the Bible's kind of out of date and has no relevance to the modern world. And when I meet people who say that, I feel quite sure that they've never read it. Isn't it true that the the patterns in Judah are just the patterns of sin today as well? not sure about other groups but in our small group last week we had a had a great discussion folks were saying it's helpful to notice these patterns of of sin and of wrong thinking to identify them in Judah so that we can learn to see them for what they are as sin against God deserving his judgment otherwise we are all the more likely to be sucked into them ourselves today So recognize the patterns. And can I say, recognize the patterns out there, yes. That's the easy bit. The easy bit is to look at the culture and the world around us and find ways that other people are breaking God's law in these same ways. The more difficult thing, and can I say the more more important thing, is not to look out there, but to look in here. Not in what ways is our culture like Judah. In what ways am I like Judah? Which leads us to the last thing we must do, which is to return to the Lord. To seek his mercy. This is what Judah failed to do. For them it was too late. Their hearts were too hardened. They'd gone on in this way of living and thinking and behaving too long. And now God's judgment was coming. But for us, for us there is still time. Still time to recognize these patterns of sin, not just in Judah, not just in our culture, but in our hearts. And to see that they leave us in desperate need of a saviour. And in the Lord Jesus, whom Isaiah will later speak about, we find a Savior who is able to cleanse us, to wash us, to free us from sin. A God who gives us a Savior, a God who gives us his spirit then to change. See, we need to be concerned that God has his rightful place in our lives. We need to be concerned that we are trusting Jesus as Savior, yes, but also that we are walking in step. That we are producing the good fruit that God will and can grow in us by his spirit. And yes, that means being concerned for all sorts of things in our world, concerned for poverty, concerned for inequality, and yes, concerned for the moral chaos that all that is all around us. There is a savior for us. There is also a savior for this morally confused world. And so our job is not just to take and trust in Christ for ourselves, but to hold out the hope he offers to others. In a chaotic and confused world, he can bring the forgiveness and the blessing and the fruitful living that we all desperately need. Let's pray together, shall we? And as we often do, let's take a moment of quiet reflection and think on what the Lord has been especially saying to us.
And this final song is a great prayer for all of us to sing, to pray, whether we're turning to trust in Jesus for the first time or whether we are returning to him again. O oh, great God of highest heaven, occupy our lowly hearts, own them all, reign supreme, conquer every rebel power. Lord, let no vice or sin remain that resists your holy war. You have loved and purchased us. Make us yours forevermore. Amen. Let's stand. Let's sing. Grace, mercy, and peace from God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit rest upon and remain with us this day and forevermore. Amen. Please do sit. Folks, just to say as well, um, two things. There are some letters at the back of the church there uh, for uh, folks who are with us regularly. As I said to Donald on the way in, it's not a check. Don't get too excited. Um, if you're coming to the picnic as well, I think we'd be best to head on straight up there uh, rather than staying around uh, too long here for chat and coffee. So see you up at the Rosile Village Hall. Thanks. Thanks.